inviting me. Um, this is like a shockingly beautiful location, and I'm really happy to be here. Um, mm -hmm. So uh, yeah, I do uh, uh, neuroscience stuff, and as a result, I study um, recurrent networks um, because your brain is a recurrent network. Um, if you're Hugo, your brain is a transformer, but if you're not, then your brain is a, a recurrent neural network. Um, and so this is going to be the focus of the whole talk. So the, the dynamic variables are called x. Um, those are like the pre-activations of the network, and the couplings are called j. Um, so there are n neurons, and x by i, where i runs from one through n. And uh, I'll assume the following very simple uh, dynamics. So these are rate-based dynamics. I'm not modeling spikes or anything. Um, so I'm expressing the time derivative here. There's a plus one on the left-hand side, which is like a decay term on the right-hand side. So with no inputs, these neurons would just decay exponentially to zero. Of course, they don't decay to zero because they receive inputs from all the other neurons in the network um, through the couplings J. And importantly, there's a pointwise nonlinearity here that I'm calling phi, which in general it takes to be some kind of a sigmoid-shaped thing. Um, okay, so the reason why this model is nice, despite the fact that it gets rid of spikes and single neuron biophysics and all this other stuff, is that I think in some sense it's like theoretical neuroscience complete, in the sense that if you could understand the mapping between the J's and the X's in full generality, then you would have answered a whole bunch of questions. Um, of course, it's complete, but also intractable. And so I'll do the physics choice of uh, choosing the weights to be random. So I'll do um, zero mean and uh, variance g squared over n, where g is some parameter that sets the width of the distribution of synaptic weights. And uh, this model has a very simple behavior in the limit when n go where n goes to infinity, so the network is infinitely big, um, which is that uh, when g is less than some critical value, there's a trivial fixed point of the system where all of the x's are just zero. And uh, when g is less than a critical value, this trivial fixed point is stable and the network is quiescent. Um, when g exceeds some critical value given by this, the network exhibits uh, chaotic activity, and that looks like this. So um, it's kind of you know, complicated, wiggly activity. And it's interesting from a neuroscience perspective because it's purely, uh, it's activity that's generated by, purely by the internal recurrent dynamics of the system. So it's not kind of you know, filtering an input, it's just a nonlinear system generating some complicated activity, which is what our brains do. Um, okay, so uh, uh, another nice thing is that um, Heim Samplinski taught us how to solve this model in the late 80s. Um, so in particular, there's a dynamical mean field theory that allows you comp to compute the uh, single neuron two-point function. So if you'd like to know the uh, you know, temporal statistics of individual neurons in this network, um, then there's a, a well-known dynamical mean field theory that allows you to do that. Um, okay, so, uh, right. Um, it's useful to think about um, what neural networks in our brains actually do, um, and in particular, they're, they're used for some kind of downstream purpose. So, um, and, and these purposes all involve kind of like reading out information from this collection of neurons. Um, so one of those purposes might be to generate uh, dynamics, so for, for example, to, pr to produce motor commands. Um, you could have a network and then you kind of read out some low dimensional projection of that to generate some, some dynamic motor command. Um, you could also have some input, so in this case you might be interested in, in transforming some temporal, temporal input to produce some output. Um, or, and I'll return to this at the end of the talk, you could be interested in having this brain region communicate to other uh, brain regions. Um, so when you take the shift in perspective to think about what you can read out from this population, um, there's a new kind of question that you realize is very relevant, which is um, something like how rich of a basis does this network provide? Or um, more precisely, how many uncorrelated basis functions like temporal basis functions are produced by this activity. Um, there's a clear geometric interpretation of this, which is you can think about the activity uh, that the network produces unfolding in some kind of a high dimensional, n dimensional uh, phase space. And so the way to phrase the question in this case would be uh, uh, how many dimensions of phase space get filled up by activity. And so um, I'll first address this question with a, a calculation. So um, I have two sets of variables, the x's and the phi's, which are the pre and the post activations. And I'll let A denote either one of those. So A could be a pre or a post activation. And uh, I'll compute the uh, covariance matrix of the activity um, with some time lag tau. And okay, to compute this dimension that I was talking of, I'll take the zero time lag covariance matrix and diagonalize it to get some eigenvalues lambda. And then I'll define the dimension as the participation ratio of the spectrum uh, just normalized by n. So the participation ratio is like a kind of soft measure of the number of large eigenvalues. Um, so like if there are d non-zero eigenvalues and the rest are zero, then the participation ratio would be d. And then I'm just normalizing by n to get a, a normalized uh, measure. So this is nice because I can 
we express the numerator denominator as the trace squared and the Frobenius norm squared, respectively, of the uh, covariance matrix. Um, and then I can further break that down in terms of the on and off diagonal statistics of this covariance matrix. And uh, the non-trivial thing is this contribution in the denominator from the uh, off diagonals, which is the uh, mean square uh, cross covariance between two distinct neurons in the network. Um, so if a given cross covariance were order one over n or smaller, this would just be zero, and uh, I would get an order one, or I would get exactly one, really, for the, the participation ratio, the normalized one, which I mean that you know, all dimensions get filled up equally. Um, however, that's not the case. So instead, the off diagonals are order one over root n. And so um, this uh, contribution from the off diagonals ends up being order one. And so the, the unnormalized dimension of the network is extensive, so it's always some fraction of the number of neurons, but it's a non-trivial fraction. So this PR, normalized PR, could be, t be anything between zero and one. Um, okay, so to compute that, um, I'm gonna try to compute this order parameter. Um, so it's just the, the mean square cross covariance, but I've allowed for different time lags for different, uh, for the two different copies, which will be useful in a second. Um, and then once I've computed this, then I can express the dimension like this. <clears throat> okay, so um, this can be uh, computed in a way that we describe in this uh, PRL paper um, using a version of the cavity method from statistical physics, but it's different in the fact, in the sense that it's a uh, two-site uh, dynamical version of the cavity method. Two sites because remember I care about correlations between distinct pairs of units. So the way this goes is I start with uh, a network um, that I call a reservoir, and it has the same statistics as the IID model that I told you about previously. Um, and this has n units indexed by i. I also have two auxiliary units, um, x mu um, indexed by Greek letters, um, and the, the indice values the indices take on are zero and zero prime, um, because one through n are taken, and zero is taken, so you need zero prime. Um, okay, so the way that this goes is you first, um, and yeah, so I have a, a weights for all these things as well. So the way that this goes is you first um, remove the auxiliary units, and you assume that the reservoir units follow some trajectories that I'll call x i of t. You then reintroduce the auxiliary units, um, and this, uh, because the connections from the, re from the auxiliary units to the reservoir are weak, they're order one over root n, there's some one over root n perturbation uh, felt by the reservoir units. Um, you then write down a uh, two-dimensional set of equations, dynamical equations for the auxiliary units, where importantly, the inputs that these units receive from the reservoir are the inputs that have been perturbed in response to their own presence. So that two-dimensional set of equations looks like this. Um, so remember, the, the Greek letter mu runs from over zero and zero prime. And uh, uh, there's this eta term, which is the cavity field, so it's the local field felt by the auxiliary units when they are not present. And then there's also this kernel uh, F, which provides like an effective coupling uh, between these two auxiliary units. And because of this kind of complicated cavity construction, um, uh, these, the, the expressions for these two terms have uh, forms such that you can compute statistics of these terms self-consistently. And uh, in doing so, you can compute that psi parameter that I told you about. So um, what does the answer look like? Um, so remember, this is the thing that I wanted to compute. Um, and uh, uh, what's nice is that um, if you specify a few things ahead of time, uh, namely the single neuron two-point functions and the single neuron linear response functions, um, both of which are computable from the classic Sompolinsky mean field theory, um, then there's a closed form analytical expression for the psi parameter in Fourier space. Um, so the psi parameter for the phi variables looks like this. So it's basically um, in the time domain, you, know, you take the single neuron two-point functions and you convolve them with some kernel that you can write down. And likewise, there's a similar but more complicated expression for the, the pre-activations for the, for the X term. Um, and the cool thing is that this holds for, for any single unit dynamics as long as you can compute what these uh, single neuron statistics are. So every neuron could be you know, extremely complicated dynamical system instead of the simple thing that I've been using and these uh, formula for the psi parameters still apply. Um, so that was with the cavity method. Um, it turns out you can also do this with a, a path integral so there's a path integral for the dynamics of an RNN, which looks like this. So it's a statistical field theory in terms of some field uh, C, which plays the role of the two-point function and it's, its conjugate field C hat. And uh, there's some dynamical action. And uh, it turns out that the psi parameter that I have been describing is related to the fluctuations around the saddle point of uh, this, this C field. And the saddle point itself gives you the classic Sompolinsky mean field theory. So to compute the, the fluctuations, you should compute the Hessian. The Hessian has um, this kind of a form, 
um, the fluctuations of this uh, C parameter are related to the inverse Hessian. And so uh, if you pick out the, the appropriate element of the inverse Hessian, uh, it schematically looks something like this. And then if you take the correct um, kind of temporal separation limits to get the tau, tau prime or tau, tau one, tau two parameter that I'm interested in, uh, you recover the same formula for, uh, that I showed from the cavity method. Um, okay, so with either of those ways of solving the problem, um, here's what the results look like. So um, now I'm showing you the participation ratio measure of dimension as a function of g for the x variables and the phi variables. And so um, one, well, there are a couple of salient features. One is that the dimension is higher for the post-activations phi than for the pre-activations x. And this is because the nonlinearity has some kind of dimension expanding effect on the activity. And that's been characterized previously in feed forward networks, but you know, here it's a, a self-consistent recurrent thing. Um, as you increase G um, away from this phase transition, which happens at G equals one, where chaotic activity sets in, the dimension starts at zero and then gradually increases. It saturates when G goes to infinity, um, but what's striking is that both overall and at these saturating values, the participation ratio dimension is very small. So it's extensive, so the dimension is always some fraction of the number of neurons, but it's a very small fraction. So it only gets up to like 6% for the Xs or like 12% for the Phis. And remember, there's no structure in the weights. In fact, it's the maximum ent entropy distribution over weights because it's IID Gaussian uh, weights. So just by virtue of neurons being connected to each other, the system is confined to a very low dimensional but extensive uh, region of phase space. Um, okay, so remember I computed not just the, the zero, zero value of this that is relevant to dimensionality, but also the, the full tau, tau prime dependence. Um, and so I can look at that to get some additional uh, insight into what's happening, into the kind of population level features of the activity. So, okay, this is just showing you that I got the right answer between theory and simulations and the, you know, the, the tau, tau one, tau two version has some shape that looks like this. Um, but what's more interesting is that um, if you look at the on diagonal of this uh, parameter, the, the tau tau slice, um, it provides you with a new um, kind of population level time scale if you look at how quickly it decays. So in the same way that the single neuron two point function, if you look at kind of its, its width as a function of tau, gives you a notion of single neuron time scales, um, this gives you a notion of the time scales that are embedded in the correlations between neurons. Um, and, uh, yeah, so you, it turns out that in the vicinity of this phase transition, as you approach the transition from above, where the network is being chaotic, um, you can write down what this is and what the psi parameter is. And uh, there's a, a short dimension on the off diagonal or the anti diagonal, um, which has time scale um, one over G minus one, which is the same as what you get from the single neuron two point function. There's also this long dimension on the diagonal uh, which is divergingly longer than the uh, single neuron time scale, which is one over G minus one squared. So somehow there's a very, very slow uh, time scale present at the population level that's not present in any individual unit. Um, so you can also see this by um, going to the principal components basis by diagonalizing the covariance matrix and projecting into that basis. Um, it turns out that the highest variance PCs are also the slowest. And uh, in particular, there's um, many principal, principal components whose time scales are much, much slower than those of individual units, which is what's shown in, in the vertical dotted lines. Um, and in fact, the slowest time scales present in the system um, diverge logarithmically in the network size n. Um, again, despite the fact that there's no structure in the weights that's trying to give you slow activity. Um, okay, so a, a nice thing about this calculation is that it provides kind of a clear path for incorporating further forms of structure into the weights. So as one example of that, you can imagine introducing correlations between reciprocal pairs of weights. So now I have some uh, correlation parameter rho. So positive rho is like uh, partially symmetric weights and negative rho is like partially anti-symmetric weights. And then rho equals one would correspond to them being you know, exactly symmetric. Um, so this modifies both the single site dynamics um, as well as the kernel that's relevant to that psi parameter and thus to dimensionality. And uh, it's kind of cool because it turns out that there's a kind of non-trivial relationship between the dimensionality and the symmetry level rho. Uh, so in particular for small values of G, um, starting to increase the level of symmetry initially increases the dimension, um, whereas for higher values of G, cranking up symmetry just decreases the dimension. So um, it's nice that you can incorporate structure. Um, that was kind of a, a you know, very particular form of structure that was just sort of arbitrary and not really motivated by, by neuroscience. Um, but some ongoing work that we're, we're doing right now um, is focused on incorporating structure from actual brains into this kind of a calculation. So what 
actual brains do we have whose structure we know? Um, it turns out in the fly, um, in the last couple of years, people have constructed the entire connectome for this, this organism. So there's a set of all the neurons and all the connections between them. Um, and uh, so you have basically a giant matrix of like tens of thousands of neurons that describes an entire fly brain, which does this, you know, the animal does this incredibly rich behavior and stuff, so it's of interest. And um, okay, so how do you characterize a structure? Well, one thing you can do is look at its SVD, and the singular value structure has some uh, decay, um, and it kind of looks like a, a power law over some range. Um, if you look at the left and right singular vectors, they have some kind of complicated overlap structure. And uh, basically, we've, we've redone the calculation I've showed you, but taken into account um, this kind of a structure for the weight matrix, where you could actually go in and plug in like biologically motivated values for these kinds of uh, uh, parameters and uh, understand analytically what is happening. Um, okay, so what are the takeaways? Um, I have 45 minutes, right? Okay, and I'm like 15 or so in. Okay, 20, okay, um, cool. So uh, in random networks, um, the dimension, activity, uh, dimension of activity is extensive, um, but fractionally small. And uh, it turns out that increasing the dimension appreciably by introducing structure in the weights is difficult. So again, just by being connected, neurons kind of confine themselves to a low dimensional part of phase space. Um, so a natural question is, um, how can we give an RNN a higher dimensional life? Um, and so one avenue is to add more dynamical degrees of freedom to the system. And this raises the question of uh, what degrees of freedom do neural circuits have that this simple model has omitted. Um, there's a very obvious one, which is synapses. So in real neural circuits, synapses are not these fixed couplings J, but rather um, undergo plasticity in response to neuronal activity. And so really synapses are dynamical variables um, in their own right, along with neurons. Um, okay, so instead of asking this question of how do the weights map onto the Xs, I can ask a more ambitious question of, if I have some time-dependent weights now, W, um, and I, I consider kind of the, the dynamic variables to be the, the combination of the synapses and the neurons, what is the joint dynamics of that kind of a system? Um, and this is something we talked about in this PRX paper. Um, okay, so here's the actual model with dynamic synapses that I'm going to study. So I'll start out with neuronal dynamics that have exactly the same form as the one that I was studying before, but now the weights are time-dependent. That's the only difference to the neuronal dynamics. Um, and I'll express the, the time-dependent couplings uh, in the following way. So there's J, which is a static random matrix. So it's like before, IID random with mean zero invariance G squared over N. But now there's this time-dependent part A. So um, th this first part describes how the synapses influence the neurons. I'm now going to have a second equation that describes how the neurons influence the synapses. And I'm going to assume a heavy end plasticity. So the synapses have some decay term uh, there's a time scale to the decay, which is P, which is really the ratio of the time scales of synapses to neurons, because the neuronal time constant is just one. And uh, the right-hand side gives the form of the like, plasticity rule. And uh, this is Hebbian, so it's the presynaptic times the postsynaptic activity. Um, here, K is a parameter that sets both the sign and the strength of the synaptic plasticity relative to the random part of the weights. So positive K is like Hebbian plasticity. Um, negative K would be called anti-Hebbian plasticity. Um, Okay, so uh, there are three parameters now, um, which is G, which is the width of the distribution of synaptic weights, uh, K, which is the sign and the strength of synaptic plasticity, and P, which is the time scale of synaptic plasticity. And uh, there's now this combined set of degrees of freedom, which consists of the N squared dynamic synapses A, together with the N uh, neuronal variables X. So there's, in total, order N squared uh, degrees of freedom to the system. Any questions about? Any, any of this? Cool. Yes? So, by RNN, you mean random? I meant recurrent, but they are all going to be random. And so, basically, Well, no, because it's nonlinear recurrent dynamics. It was not, it was, sorry, it was, it was um, so the neuronal dynamics, even with fixed weights, are nonlinear. Okay. Now I have nonlinear neuronal dynamics with synaptic plasticity. Um, but you're right that even if I removed the neuronal nonlinearity, this would still be a nonlinear system because I have synaptic dynamics. Whereas before, if I had taken the neuronal nonlinearity out, then it would just be a linear system. 
cool, okay. Um, so what does this do? So um, it turns out that if you place this in the correct part of that three-dimensional parameter space, um, you again get a chaotic activity, but now it's kind of a joint neuronal synaptic chaotic state. And that looks something like this. So the, the neurons wiggle around. So here are just two neurons that are wiggling around. But now also the uh, synaptic connections that reciprocally connect them are also wiggling around. And they wiggle around um, around a baseline, uh, which is the static J thing. Um, okay, so you can describe this using a um, dynamical mean field theory. And um, it has this kind of a form. So A is some Gaussian random field. And the effective plasticity turns out to be captured by this um, self-coupling integral. So phi of T is like, the nonlinearity applied to x of t in this single site picture. Um, and so it's basically a uh, nonlinear coupling of this single site variable x to itself. Um, and it occurs through this um, kernel. Um, and the kernel turns out to depend self consistently on the single neuron uh, two point function C phi. Um, so basically, what's happening is that I'm, I'm capturing the effective plasticity in this mean field picture by adding a self coupling to every neuron, but it's a nonlinear. Uh, time delayed self coupling that depends on the single neuron statistics in a self consistent way. And this is actually exactly the same as um, what Ludwig was talking about where um, when you revisit the same sample twice in SGD that has some amplifying effect later on because it is sort of saved in the weights, this is the exact same kind of thing. Um, I, I have you know, synaptic dynamics that are storing neuronal vectors in the weights and therefore those neuronal vectors get amplified um, in the neuronal activity. So it's actually exactly the same as the first talk, which is kind of cool. Different guys, obviously. Um, okay, so the system has a, uh, a rich phase diagram um, that we explored in depth in that paper. But um, in the spirit of um, talking about like population level features of the activity, I'm going to focus on kind of a spectral analysis of the system. So there are two ways to do this kind of a thing. Um, one is to look at the Jacobian of the system, which would capture the uh, local linear dynamics along the lines of what you asked about. Um, so the Jacobian now is a block structured matrix with a uh, neuron by neuron block, a synapse by synapse block, and these off block diagonals that capture their interaction. So this is the n plus n squared by n plus n squared matrix. Um, you can also look at the uh, Lyapunov spectrum, uh, which involves multiplying together a bunch of Jacobians along a trajectory and then diagonalizing that. And that captures the global nonlinear dynamics. Um, and just for the purpose of this talk, I'll evaluate both these objects on a chaotic trajectory. Um, and it turns out that on chaotic trajectories and the n to infinity limit, there's some kind of a typical behavior of both of these objects. Um, okay, so the Jacobian um, has some special structure, and that structure arises by virtue of the fact that um, there are, remember, there are n squared synapses, so there's a very high dimensional space of synapses, but in any instant, the neurons only provide n dimensional input to that space. And so this turns out to induce a low dimensional structure in this Jacobian. So in particular, it has eigenvalue minus one over P with multiplicity N squared minus N. So these are synaptic modes that do not receive input from neurons um, that just relax with the synaptic time scale, which is P. Um, so there's two N remaining eigenvalues to account for that result from the interaction of the N neurons with the N dimensional subspace of synaptic space that receives input from neurons. And those are the eigenvalues of a smaller object called the reduced Jacobian, which is a 2n by 2n matrix. Um, and you can compute the spectrum of that matrix from random matrix theory. Um, really, it's the kind of boundary around the spectrum in the complex plane, like I'll, I'll show you in the next slide. Um, there's one thing worth noting here, which is that um, despite having order n squared degrees of freedom, um, the local linear dynamics, at least, are um, only order n dimensional. So even though I've, you know, quadratically increase the number of degrees of freedom, the actual dynamics themselves uh, have not observed that same scaling. Um, okay, so but anyways, let me look at what these spectra uh, actually look like. Um, so in these plots, they're all going to be in the complex plane, so I'm showing you a scattering of complex eigenvalues. Um, the color uh, reflects the degree to which the corresponding eigenvector is neuron versus synapse dominated. So in particular, a red mode is like a synaptic mode, and there's always going to be a dot here, which indicates that a delta function of n squared minus n purely synaptic modes. Um, okay, so this is for k equals zero. For k equals zero, the system reduces to a non-plastic network, which has a circularly symmetric kind of a spectrum. Uh, this dotted line is the stability line, so modes to the right of this line kind of locally drive the chaotic dynamics in the system. Um, 
Okay, so what happens as you turn on plasticity, so here I'm cranking up K into the Hebbian uh, regime. Uh, it turns out there's a, a topological transition where, um, well, first this, this kind of delta function of synaptic modes creates a hole in the spectrum, but with further increases of, of K, there's a transition to this form of two disconnected components. The uh, eigenvalues to the right of the stability line get increasingly pinched towards the real axis. This corresponds to a slowing of the system, basically because the, the neurons are always attracted to themselves by virtue of heavy and plasticity. So you can also see that from the mean field theory. Um, and what's more striking is that um, this, this part of the spectrum that's driving the dynamics is dominantly synaptic. So it's really the synapses that are running the show here um, as opposed to, to neurons. So it kind of flips your view of the network as being synapses connected by neurons rather than neurons connected by synapses. Um, as you decrease K into the anti heavy regime, you get these dominantly imaginary lobes that uh, are unstable, and this turns out to correspond to some oscillatory behavior observed in the anti heavy regime because the, the neurons are always getting repelled from themselves by the anti heavy plasticity. Um, so there's just a, a further plot of that in the kind of GK parameter plane, um, and again, generically, as you increase K and you make the activity more, you make the system more heavy in, you get this kind of synapse-driven dynamic state. Um, you can also compute the Lyapunov spectrum. Um, this has to be done numerically. You can't do the, the random matrix thing to get this. Um, well, maybe you could, I, I did not do that. Um, so here I'm just showing the maximum Lyapunov exponent throughout GK uh, parameter space. Um, but you can also compute the full, um, or let me, let me say first, if you, if you look at the full spectrum of Lyapunov exponents, um, this is for the non-plastic network. And so um, you just get n Lyapunov of exponents from the, the regular non-plastic network, but then there's all of these kind of useless um, uh, synaptic degrees of freedom sitting around, and that just gives you a spike of uh, n squared um, Lyapunov of exponents at minus one over p. Um, so uh, computing the full spectrum of Lyapunov of exponents, of which there are n plus n squared, uh, is intractable because you have to keep track of n plus n squared uh, n plus n squared dimensional basis vectors. Um, however, um, you're sort of saved by the fact um, that uh, order um, n squared of those exponents concentrate at minus one over p, and they're only uh, roughly two n uh, non-trivial exponents. So it, it's exactly the same as the, the linear picture, where even though you've like quadratically increased the number of degrees of freedom, the actual dynamics of the system are still order n dimensional. Um, so anyways, using that fact, you can, um, uh, compute sort of the largest and smallest lapid of exponents, the, the order n largest and smallest ones, and uh, basically get a picture of the whole spectrum of lapid of exponents. And the main takeaway is that um, this totally recapitulates the conclusions from the Jacobian picture, which is that as you crank up plasticity into the Hebbian regime, you get this uh, topological transition uh, where the lapid of spectrum segregates into two distinct bands, um, and this is just comparing the two kinds of spectra. Um, so uh, once you have this Lapidus spectrum, you can further compute various diffeomorphic uh, properties of the strange attractor uh, using this. So just to drive from the fact that the dynamics are really n-dimensional, you can compute this uh, measure of the intrinsic dimensionality using the Kaplan-York conjecture, uh, and you see that the, the dimension is uh, linear in n. Um, and moreover, it's a pretty small fraction of n, similar to the participation ratio result from the first part. Um, and so, yeah, this underscores the fact that the dynamics are, like the non-plastic case, um, order n dimensional. Um, okay, so to recap, um, despite the synaptic degrees of freedom not changing the scaling of the dimension of the dynamics, the system nevertheless has uh, uh, extremely, well, it's not totally recap, it's the next thing. Um, the system nevertheless has um, interesting and intriguing uh, computational properties. Um, so I'll focus on one of them, which is the, this effect called freezable chaos which is related to these kind of, uh, these lines and the, the phase diagram. Um, so this effect is defined in the following way. Um, uh, so I have like 20 minutes left? 15? Okay. Um, cool, that's great. So freezable chaos is defined in the following way. So um, I have some uh, network with synaptic plasticity um, that's in this kind of uh, chaotic state. And at this first black line, I'm going to um, turn off the synaptic dynamics. Um, it turns out that the effect this has is that I save a fixed point, 
um, of the resulting neuronal dynamics um, at the location in phase space that the neurons were at when I turned off plasticity. So I'm essentially freezing the system in time by creating a stable fixed point of the neuronal, neuronal dynamics by disabling the synaptic dynamics. Um, and just to demonstrate that this is actually stable, I can perturb the neurons here, and you know, they relax back to where they were before, and I can even do the more extreme thing of clamping the neurons at zero, uh, and then they spring back to where they were before. At this second dashed line, I'm releasing the synapses, and the system returns to this joint neuronal synaptic uh, chaotic state. And then I can do the same thing again at a later time, where I halt the synapses, and again I create a stable fixed point, but now it's, it's a fixed point wherever the neurons were here, as opposed to where they were here. Um, so this is characterized by, uh, or th 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 this happens when K, the plasticity strength, is sufficiently big. Um, if it's not big enough, you get non-freezable chaos where no memory is retained, and if it's kind of in the middle, um, you get this intermediate thing that I call semi-freezable chaos where you still retain some memory of the neurons, but um, when you halt the synapses, but there's also some dynamic activity on top of it. Um, and those were the phase transition boundaries that I showed in the phase diagram. Um, okay, so you can analyze, with it, analyze this with a uh, mean field theory. Um, you get kind of a, a two replica setup uh, where one replica has synaptic dynamics and the other one does not, and the overlaps um, between those two um, tell, give you this overlap parameter that tells you uh, whether or not a memory of the neurons has been retained in the activity. Um, and you can you know, visualize this kind of a phase transition with uh, increasing K. And uh, this is extremely evocative from a neuroscience perspective of uh, working memory. So if you, if, I mean, working memory is the idea that you want to quickly retain some information uh, uh, in your brain to use it you know, a little bit later, like remember a phone number or something. Um, and just to sort of uh, exemplify how this could be used for working memory, um, a student did some work where you drive a network um, with a sinusoid. So this is a, a network with synaptic dynamics that's being driven by some uh, input. And uh, the question is, uh, can you remember kind of the, the phase of this, this sign pattern um, over some long delay interval, so it's analogous to a working memory task, um, using this freezable cast mechanism? Um, so here at this first line, she's simultaneously turning off the input, but also disabling synaptic plasticity, and you uh, store this kind of a fixed point, and then uh, at the second line, you're um, releasing the synapses and you go back to being uh, dynamic, and I think also turn back on the input, um, but the point is that because of this freezable chaos mechanism, you get approximate continuity of the activity across this long delay interval, um, despite the fact that the input was turned off. Um, so during this uh, delay interval, the network can have a whole life of its own using its neuronal dynamics, um, but then it can always return to where it was before um, because it has a fixed point at that location. So here, um, at the first line, the synaptic plasticity is being turned off, but the inputs stay on. So now there's some uh, you know, activity um, after this period, um, but nevertheless, um, you still get continuity across this long uh, interval, despite that you were doing stuff in the middle. Um, so this is just a more explicit neuroscience example where you can do a delay match the sample task. It's something that people do in experiments. Um, there's some other work being done by a student now that I think is really interesting um, that has to do with kind of a dynamic form of memory in these networks. So um, again, uh, we're going to drive one of these uh, networks with plastic synapses with a sinusoidal input, um, but now there's no explicit manipulation of synapses. Um, so instead, the manipulation is that you, you have the input turned on and it's, it's strong and stuff, but then you just turn it off. And it turns out that if you're in the right part of parameter space that's being shown here, the network will continue to ring with uh, that kind of sinusoidal pattern. So uh, just sort of by having ongoing plasticity, you get this free kind of uh, effect where the network will continue to reproduce um, an input that it's been shown. Um, so the reason why this works turns out to be that um, uh, when you're supplying the input, um, it pulls out a complex conjugate pair of outliers from the, the weight matrix. Um, remember, we have heavy implicity, which corresponds to having a symmetric addition to the random background matrix. So you might think that a symmetric matrix could only create um, real outliers, um, but it turns out that because when you uh, drive the network with a sinusoid, there's some complicated activity that emerges um, that's shaped by the random part of the weights, and the plastic part of the weights 
is shaped by that activity. And so the A matrix actually knows about the J matrix and that kind of relationship allows you to have these complex conjugate outliers. Um, so uh, there's also some work that uh, uh, my advisor Larry did on showing how to, uh, what, what happens when you try to train these plastic networks on actual tasks and possible benefits of having uh, plasticity from a learning perspective. Um, so here, rather than training all of the recurrent weights, he's just training this kind of uh, rank one feedback loop um, to produce this kind of a, a time-dependent output pattern. And um, uh, specifically, he's just training the readout weights. It's called uh, force learning. Um, and uh, uh, basically, the main result is that a, a network with purely neuronal dynamics cannot learn to produce this output. Um, it turns out that having these long delays in the output makes it hard for networks to learn this. Um, but by having a uh, synaptic dynamics in the network, you actually can learn this task. Um, so that's cool. And so you might think that you know, you're adding these additional degrees of freedom. They have kind of a longer time scale because P is larger than one. And so um, you know, maybe just having kind of long time scales helps to learn these long, you know, bridge these long gaps in the output. Um, but it turns out to be more subtle than that because you can look at these um, uh, Jacobian spectra um, over the course of this uh, task execution. Um, and it turns out that what happens is, uh, um, so the, the, this kind of dot on this line is kind of the clump of uh, synaptic eigenvalues. And this bulk is the neuronal modes. And over the course of executing this task, um, this bulk of neuronal modes kind of um, uh, expands and then recompresses. Um, and that kind of uh, expansion to the, the, the stability line and then recompression is what kind of uh, marks the beginning and end of uh, this delay period. So we're still trying to understand that better, but there's some kind of a non-trivial neuronal synaptic joint dynamics mechanism underlying this. Um, okay, so uh, um, yeah, I'll try, I'll try to wrap up in the next five minutes or so. Um, so we've seen that um, uh, low dimensional activity uh, is ubiquitous in models of neural systems. And uh, this raises the question of what could it be useful for? And so I'll close by discussing uh, one thing that I think this is, this is good for, um, which is routing of activity between uh, brain regions. So uh, my motivation for this um, is this really beautiful experimental work um, from Samoto et al. Um, about so-called communication subspaces between cortical areas. Um, so in this work, they had access to um, simultaneously recorded neuronal activity in uh, V1 and V2 um, primary and secondary visual cortex in a monkey. And their question was, um, how does the activity in V1 get communicated to V2? Um, the main findings that are summarized in this uh, picture are that um, only a small number of V1 dimensions are correlated with activity in V2. Um, and uh, moreover, these dimensions are distinct from the primary dimensions of variation in V1, namely dimensions you would get by doing like PCA on the activity in V1. And uh, this is consistent with there being a uh, low rank um, matrix that projects from V1 to V2 that projects out um, you know, some of the activity patterns in V1 and communicates some other activity patterns to V2. Um, so what would this be useful for in, in, in a routing context? Well, you could have some source region um, that routes some signals to target region A and some signals to target region B through different communication subspaces. Um, and uh, so you, know, you can send different signals to A versus B by kind of projecting out different dimensions of activity from the, the source region. And importantly, the communication depends on both the uh, you know, actual form of the communication subspaces, but also with the alignment of the subspaces with the activity in the source region. It's kind of a source region activity dependent way of routing activity. Um, so this is a really beautiful experimental theoretical work, but um, it's unclear what happens when you um, uh, implement this kind of uh, communication subspace uh, based routing in a recurrent network where you have a bunch of regions talking to other regions in a recurrent way. And um, I think you're running out of time, but we um, uh, worked out the, the uh, theory of this using uh, a dynamical mean field theory. And um, the basic setup is that um, we have R regions and N neurons per region. We keep the number of regions finite, but then take N to infinity. And we have some neuronal dynamics like this, where J gets upgraded to have both neuronal and region indices. Um, and I'm parameterizing the weights as a IID random part within regions 
um, plus uh, this low rank part. So mi, nj is like a rank one vector with kind of pair of region specific indices. Um, is it, the, the point is that the, the cross region connectivity is rank one and uh, m and n are the vectors that go into these rank one cross region matrices. Um, and uh, we, we parameterize the correlations among these rank one vectors with some third order tensor and uh, that's meant to be visualized here. So, so T is the kind of key thing that gives the, the N M overlaps and that turns out to orchestrate um, communication between regions in this mean field theory. So the, the order parameters describing the signal transmission between regions turns out to be um, directed currents between uh, pairs of regions and uh, so there's a, a matrix of order parameters that describes these currents and the dynamics of those currents is controlled by this third order tensor. So normally, you know, neuronal dynamics is dynamics of a vector shaped by a synaptic weight matrix, but now the region to region dynamics are dynamics of a matrix shaped by a third order tensor. Um, but um, uh, it turns out that you can, uh, you know, analyze these dynamics and in particular, there's a, there's a matrix you can associate to this third order tensor whose spectrum turns out to be indicative of what kinds of, of behavior unfolds in this low dimensional uh, space. And uh, yeah, so the conclusions that I'd like to end with are um, uh, a variety of new and neuroscientifically relevant questions arise when uh, RNN activity is viewed at the population level. Um, and these statistical physics kinds of methods are up to the task of addressing these questions. Um, recurrent networks generically produce low dimensional activity simply by virtue of the components being connected to one another. Um, and uh, one question that I wonder about is um, whether this sort of generic fact is what sets the limit on the dimensionality observed in real neural circuits. Um, alternative possibilities would be that um, task complexity is kind of a more stringent limiter of activity dimension, or maybe the need for selectively communicating between regions like I talked about in the last part. Um, uh, a question that I think we're still left with is how can we construct RNNs um, with higher dimensional lives? And also how can we stuff uh, the kind of synaptic version of this question is how can we stuff more information into synapses, which is the whole problem of learning with, you know, uh, biologically plausible plasticity rules and so on. Um, so with that, I'll thank my advisors and collaborators. Thanks. <laughs> All right, we have time for a couple of quick questions. Hi, thank you for the great talk. It was really interesting. I have, maybe it's a general question in all those uh, recurrent networks. For the training you're learning, if I understood well, those synaptic wakes, are those um, like biologically set as excitatory or inhibitory neurons? Are those free? Uh, how do you set those ar architectural details? Yeah, so the, one of the many biological facts that I'm ignoring with all of this work is the excitatory inhibitory split. So like in reality, there's this thing called Dale's Law, which you know about, that says that um, basically the columns of the synaptic weight matrix should either be all positive or all negative because neurons, not synapses, are excitatory inhibitory. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm ignoring that okay. there. Um, uh, yeah, uh, there's a variety of other things to say about that, but uh, yeah, there's no EI split. Okay, great. I, it, it, the, the dynamics that occur there are really interesting, so it, it was great. I, I really enjoyed the talk. More questions? Uh, very cool results. Uh, I just wonder, can you say something about the, uh, like when the underlying network is sparse? Uh, like, I mean, each neuron has just a constant number of neighbors. Yeah. So like, like uh, for example, can you do the, can you write down the cavity method calculation for this kind of sparse model? Yeah, I see. Uh, presumably you could. I mean, I think that's the, that setting where each, each unit has a small number of neighbors is like the setting in which cavity methods are usually applied, um, like tree structured things and stuff. Um, uh, yeah, I, I haven't thought much about that. People have certainly thought about the dynamics of these kinds of recurrent networks where there's dilute synapses, so like order one connections, like you said, and not order n per neuron. Um, uh, yeah, that'd be interesting. I don't have any clear idea of what to expect. All right, maybe I'll ask one. Um, so you presented 
really a lot of results and a lot of models. I wonder if you can validate any of this on some real data, like uh, let's say the fruit fly or, because here one question is what's the right model or right. what's a proper model, right? So at some point you showed that if you also learn the, the Ws, then you're able to express more complicated functions, so that's very nice. I wonder how far are we to actually trying to validate this on, yeah. on an organism that lives. Yeah, there's some, uh, um, right. Uh, yeah, in terms of like concrete tests of the kinds of things that I was talking about, one thing that I have thought a bit about is uh, the kind of freezable chaos type mechanism for working memory that I talked about. You can in principle imagine trying to validate that. There's like tons and tons of experiments on working memory. Um, including things where you sort of like, uh, uh, you know, try to screw the animal up while it's doing some task. Um, so, uh, and there are kind of motor tasks like this as well, where the animal will be doing some reach or something and you try to screw it up in the middle. And I think that the thing that I, uh, the mechanism I presented would make different predictions for what should happen to either the behavior or the neural activity, if you can record that, depending on whether the mechanism underlying the motion or the working memory or whatever is synapse-based versus neuron-based. Um. Okay, then let's thank David again. <laughs>